light arise, letting our light shine forth, and that the Gentiles and people will come to our light. He's been talking about you getting out, you inviting your family and your friends to church, and people that you come in contact with. If you don't invite them, they're not coming. The, the, the majority of people that come to church come because they were invited by someone they knew and could connect with a little bit. Most people do not do drive-bys and go, I think I'll just come to this church. There are people that do it. There are people that do it. But most people are not that strong to walk into a church or a, to a setting just, you know, I think I'll just try this church. Most people want someone to invite them. They want to feel comfortable. They want to sit with somebody. So we got this book called The Call of a Christian. Buy this book read this book. This book has just lit my fire. It, it talks about, I'm going to read a couple chapters. No, not chapters, but chapter titles to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just want to read a couple chapter titles to you. Then I want to sh just share with you real quick what happened to me last week, and it won't be long. But um, who, who, I'm saved. That's the first, that's the first step. Who, who, I'm saved. There are giants in the lo land, outwitnessed by a five-year-old, gone fishing. The watch lady, you're already there, unashamed. I'm so glad you're here. What is my ministry? What if God's perfect will is you? In other words, it's saying, what if you are the one that's supposed to talk to that person? You can pray all you want, but if you don't open your mouth, they're not getting saved. That's just the, that's just the way it is. Overcoming frustration. Ordinary or spirit-filled, your sphere of influence. How do I know if the Lord is leading me to talk to somebody? That's a great one. What if they reject me? The, great, the grease factory, happy are the soul winners, boldness, cancer and Buddhism. Are you serving two masters? Okay, on and on and on. I started reading this book. I actually started in the middle because I was saved. Woohoo! So I knew a lot of the stuff up to the middle of the book. But I started in the middle and read to, towards the end. Awesome. Talks about how to minister to Jehovah's Witnesses, how to minister to all kinds of people, how not to be afraid. It used to be that I thought that I had to wait for that perfect opportunity when it would arise where I could just inject something about Jesus. And God honored that in me because I was never comfortable with going up to someone and going, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? I just... I, I just cold turkey. I, that's just not me. Now, what I've learned, though, that there is a way to go up cold turkey when the Lord is leading you and ask them if they know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, because the Bible says everybody knows right from wrong. And so I don't have to wait for that perfect opportunity anymore. But the best way for you to witness to someone is those people that you come in contact with every day of your life, people that you've established some kind of a connection with. So start praying to the Lord about how and what to say and when to say to them. Because I, I have a neighbor, and she comes down every year. This is her third year, or while I was here, I've been here about thir three years in my house. And I told the Lord, and I've, I've been injecting things and doing things, and I just, in my soul, after reading this, if I don't say something, I, she's not going to hell on my watch. I, we've become friends. We've become friends. I know better than this, you know? And so I, I, I brought her over to my house, but I was at a point where I could say, I'm going to call her Sally. I'm not going to call her by name. Sally, you know, we've known each other for three years now. I need, I need to ask you a personal question. And up where she comes from, there are two things you do not talk about. And it is still very, very solid in that area of the United Politics States. Politics and... Religion. And I said, and I knew that. And I said, I just need to know this because um, I want to make sure you make heaven with me. I, I can't let you not on my watch at least share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with you. And I shared with her, you know, what that was. And she's like, yeah, I, I'm all about that. I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> But after I spoke to her, I do believe that she, she goes to Episcopal Church in Vermont. And I do believe. I'm 90% convinced. Convinced. But I read the scriptures to her. I showed her in case she wasn't just exactly how to do it. And so when I was in Nashville, I walked up to two little girls. You know, when you're in a trauma ward for three days and everybody's hurting and aching and bones are broken and everybody's crushed up, 
that is a perfect opportunity to talk to people about the healing power and the saving power of Jesus Christ. So you're already in a situation where they're hurting inside. And this little 14-year-old girl said, please, please pray for my mother. You know, she was in a bad car wreck. And then I prayed for her mother. You know, her name was Crystal. And then I asked her, I said, you know, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? She's like, I don't know. I think so. And then I asked her because, you know, it was a, I was easy. I'd already connected with her. Does that make sense? And she said, I, I don't, I'm not sure. i like, would you like to be sure? Because you can be sure. And then we just went from there. And I got her born again. Her cousin comes in the next day. And um, I waited a bit for her cousin. I just didn't have the leading to do it yet. But they said, we're coming back tonight. And we're going to straighten our hair, and we're going to look really pretty. Because I wanted to take their picture. They're like, no, our hair is all messy. I said, all right. I took their picture anyways. But <laughs> they came back, and I didn't see them all day. I mean, right before I left, I had been with my brother all day on my feet, just with him. And it was a good day, but I was tired and hungry. They come walking in at, like, right before they closed the trauma ward down. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, I, I, I told you. I told, I told you I, would, I knew this was the time. And so I took them off to the side because they had straightened their hair. They looked beautiful. And they wanted, to, they wanted my um, approval of how did they look. And uh, so we just, you know, connected for a little bit for about five minutes. And then I posed the question to Kashmir. And I said, Kashmir? And I asked her the same question. Do you know the Lord as your personal Savior? And uh, if you were, and she, you know, Lexus had already, I think, been connecting with her. And she's like, well, well. I don't know, but we're all going to be forgiven, right? And I said, and the way I was able to connect with Kashmir is because the day before, she said, oh, let me show you a picture of my family. I have a little brother in California. I have a big brother. You know, she, she's just alone, but she's got brothers all over the place. And she opened up Facebook page, showed me her big brother. He's probably 20, 19. She's like, don't judge him. I didn't say anything. She just said, don't judge him. So, you know, I'm not going to judge anybody. And so... You know, he's all black, and he black hood, black whatever. I'm like, oh, he's cute, you know? I just left it. So that night, I said, Kashmir, do you remember when you told me not to judge your brother? She said, yes. I said, I can't judge your brother. All judgment is gone off your brother, and it's all judgment is gone off me and you because Jesus took our judgment, and he took our sin, and I went from there. She's just looking at me, you know, and I explained her the, the gospel of salvation, because of what she said about her brother. And, and I'm like, but it's not automatic. Just because he took your judgment, he took your sin, you have to accept him. And I got her, she accepted the Lord. You know, but when I first asked her about, do you know the Lord is your personal savior? Alexis is standing beside me. And Kashmir says to me, do I look like a Satanist to you? Because <laughs> she had black, She's, she was dressed in black. And I didn't even think about that. I'm like, I've never thought about that. You look pretty tonight, you know? Do I look like a Satanist to you? And Lexus, her name's Lexus, like the car, she looked over at her cousin, she says, Kashmir, she asked me the same question yesterday. So just, you know, get yourself together. And then she just calmed down, and then I talked about her brother, and she's like, oh, it all made sense. But if you start praying and seeking God about people to talk to, God will get all over you, and you will get them born again. You need to buy this book. It set me on fire. I'm sorry. I took all your time. She didn't take my time. She took yours. I've still got my hour and a half sermon. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know what was fun was that I was, I'd call Lisa and I'd go, How's your brother doing? She goes, oh, wonderful, but I got a girl born again today. And I said, okay. And then we talked later. She says, I said, how's your brother? This is the next day. Good. I got another girl born again today. She said, and then I walked into the trauma ward and there was this boy in there that had been in a wreck and she got to pray for him and he was so hopeless. You know, people are hopeless. They, the world, you know, there's a song, what the world needs now is love. They need love. They need love. And you're, you're, you're the answer to their prayer. Amen. 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 So we, need, we do need to start thinking about that way. Get your Bibles out and go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. 
<clears throat> Are you all ready for the word? Amen. All right. Now, I, this is a question I'm going to ask you. How many of you deal with guilt and condemnation at least somewhat? Okay. Uh, did you know that I was reading a book the other day and, and, and um, it says everyone has a certain amount of guilt and condemnation temperature they carry around. We all deal with this situation. And I want to show you today how to get free from all guilt and condemnation. Now, there's, gonna, you, there's a part you play in this. Um, but, so I'm going to show you this because the condemnation is the thing that's hindering you in your walk with God. Now, I want to show you the scripture, and then we're going to pray. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The word according to the flesh is referring to those born of the Spirit versus those just born of the flesh and not born again. That's not talking about people who are spiritual there. So the Bible says there's no condemnation. When I first read that, years ago, oh, it just set me free. But I had this nagging, why do I feel condemned so much? Why do I feel like God doesn't like me, doesn't care about me? Why do I feel like I'm not important and yet other people are? And so, I, you know, this, this, I realized that spiritually there was no condemnation. Jesus took it all. So do me another favor and go to 1 John chapter 3. Let's talk about your heart. The Bible talks about your heart condemns you. We just learned that God does not condemn you. But you and I must come to grips with your and my heart does condemn us. Sometimes when you're wrong, sometimes when you're not. That's right. I, had a, I had a girl that lived near me, and she was taught all of her life that TV was evil. She came over one night and watched Bonanza with us, and her heart condemned her because she was taught wrong. See, sometimes you got your heart condemning you and you didn't do anything wrong. But there's other times your heart is saying no, 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 because you are doing wrong. So I want to talk about how to get free from that. And I want to talk about living right. Now, now, as I say that, I'm going to make a statement to you. Over the years, when I would preach on living right, I would have people say these words to me. You're not going to preach me under condemnation. And that always kind of threw me. I thought, I'm not preaching you under condemnation. But where that comes from is that for many years, ministers would, would try to use fear and condemnation to preach people afraid and get them to quit sinning. And that, that's a wrong approach. That's completely wrong. You, you need to learn who you are and how much God loves you. And those, the, that, that'll help you come out of living in sin. Plus the fact that you're not a sinner at all. And most Christians don't know that. Most pastors don't know that. So sometimes the, the guy preaching is really preaching out of his own heart. And see, he, he thinks he's helping you because he don't know how to get out from under guilt and condemnation himself. Now, but in America today, what many of you that are in here, we have, a, uh, we have, all, we have all ages in this church, but it just appears that we have more older people older, me and older, over 35 or 40, as opposed to a whole church full of yuppies. Do you understand that? Except for, you know, the, the three, four, five on the row here, uh, you know, young upcoming executive types. So, so because of that, many of us remember a day when even sinners were moral. Do y'all remember that? I mean, you know, you went to the bank and I mean, this guy wasn't saved, but he was a, but he was a moral God-fearing, good person. And, and, and people everywhere, they shook their hands, they kept their word. 
and we preached, we had to preach, we had to preach to them, there's none righteous, no, not one, because these people were so good. That has turned. Now we're dealing with society that has gone completely berserk, and, and sin is very popular, and it's cool supposedly. And that's it. That's come into the church. And so there's where we get this, um, don't, don't preach me under condemnation. Because what happens is people are sitting there in church and they haven't been living right. And they don't want a sermon on that. They don't want to go home feeling worse than they came. Do, y'all don't want to go home going, I feel like, I felt terrible when I came. I feel worse now. <laughs> well, I can tell you what you're going to do. You're not coming back. You're thinking, I ain't going back in that church. That guy, I mean, when he got finished with me, he beat me up so bad. I ain't never going back. So we don't want to preach you under condemnation, quote, unquote. But, but after I begin to think about that, the Lord began to deal with me that preaching on living right frees you from condemnation. It, it's not, you know, holiness preached correctly or... Being a doer of the Word of God was designed by God to free you from guilt and condemnation. Now, I want to read something I wrote. It says, when you mention obedience, most people think you're asking them to add rules to an already overstressed, overworked, overcommitted life. Now, I I pastor. I I hear y'all. My God, pastor, I mean... I mean, we got school and karate and work and the, the lawn and the laundry and, you know, and yet you walk into church and somebody starts adding more rules to you and you think, I can't handle this. I'm going to show you how to live so totally free that you actually wake up every morning enjoying your life. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Yeah you, yeah, you can do this. Yeah, we can. All of us can wake up going, I, I love my life. And, and it works. Even the hard places I'm going to show you will be made straight. Even the mountains will be made low. The valleys will come up. God will show you how to make your life and take hard out of it. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Christianity is not adding to your burden, it's taking it away. It's making your life enjoyable for once in your life. All right, let me finish reading this. This is true. Obedience is to change your lifestyle to, to total obedience to God and His will and His way, allowing God to handle the areas of your life that you think are number one. All right. The only reason for obedience to God is to please God and not self. Let's stop for a minute and let me make a statement to you as we get started. A person walking into a church will never do what the Bible says do until they have the mindset, I'm here to please God. Yes. Not, not ever going to happen. Because as long as you are trying to add Christianity to your life, it's not going to work. You can't mix them. They don't mix. And so today... We, that's where a lot of our problems are coming, but yet there's a fear factor in, oh, you, you walk, you mean totally, totally sell out, oh, totally, oh, he'll, he'll send me to Africa and make a monk or a nun out of me, I am not doing that. <laughs> and so there's this fear factor involved. In the garden, the biggest issue you're going to face in your life is going to be the same issue that Adam and Eve faced. Did God say? Now, you, I can't do that for you. You have to make up, you must make up your mind that what God said was for your benefit, yeah. not for your detriment. So when in the garden, Satan said, 
did God say not to eat of that tree? And Eve, and Eve walked up and said, well, it looks good. I don't understand why God would say not to eat of that tree. Now, think about this. Is God for you or against you? He is for you. So he is out to make your life easier, not harder. Now, you have to overcome that because what's going to happen is you're going to pick your Bible up and you're going to read things and go, that's impossible. And it is. So I'm going to make a statement to you right now. Christianity is not hard. It's impossible. Without grace, you can't do this. That's a powerful statement. If there is no grace, adding the word to your life or trying to, is just going to create more hell in your life. I got to pray more now. I got to read the Bible more now. I got to start witnessing now. And I got to do the do the do the do the do. I mean, I'm stressed now. And that is exactly the way many people approach obedience to God. Obedience to God is not going to add stress. It is the thing that's going to eliminate all of the stress. So in 1 John, go to 1 John chapter 3, 16. It says, this we know, by this we know love because he laid his life down for us. We ought to lay our lives down for other brethren. There we go, laying my life down. He wants me to work in the nursery now. All right. And what... <laughs> And whoever has this world's goods, now he's after my money, and sees this brother in need and shuts his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children don't love in word or in tongue, but deed and truth. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. The, the issue that you're going to face every day is that as long as you and I are not doing what he says, our heart is going to condemn us. Our heart is not going to allow us to enjoy life. And you're going to start looking for love in all the wrong places. There is only one place you will ever find joy, peace, or salvation, and it's in the Word of God. What you're looking for in life is only found in this book. This is the only, this is number one, numero uno book. And outside of it, you don't have a life. All right, now, so obedience to it is the key. Now listen, let's go. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have a confidence toward God. And then whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, stop for a minute and let's ask a question. I can, we can have a line up here and pray for you, and I'll explain to you in a minute why sometimes we do have lines and pray for you. But if you're not going to go home after that and pick your Bible up and start doing it, you're going to get in the same mess you got prayed for for. So, so in other, there's a point that we've got to balance out. See, if, if you've, the name of Jesus will get all the trash off you. And there's times you need to walk up and go, lay your hands on me and let's get me free. I don't know how I got all messed up again, but you just lay your hands on me, get in agreement with me and get me delivered from this. But at the same time, we can't just have healing lines or deliverance lines every Sunday morning. We have to have some responsibility where you go home and realize, how do I get out of this and stay out of this mess? That's right. So obedience does that. Now, let me, let me finish this. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. So Lisa and I are always dealing with people coming in and going, I want to be healed. But 
But there's more to it than I just want to be healed. I just want to be delivered. I want you to pray for me. I mean, my kids are driving me crazy. My husband's, my husband is, is you know, in my life is I'm about to pull all of my hair out of my head. And people walk in like that and we sympathize with you. We really do. But let me ask you a question. Why is it that people in India, Africa, and Russia who have a life that is not anywhere near as good as yours are happy? Because it isn't the circumstance in your life that is your problem. Until you decide to obey God, the, the situation is not going to change. Now, now, parents do this all the time. They come in and, you know, my kids are, are, are not living right. They're not doing right. They're just brats. And, you know, and you sympathize with them and you stick them in a youth group. You stick them in children's church. But then stop for a minute. You want them as a parent to do right. Well, God also, mom and dad, want you to do right. It's not enough to send them to church. They're coming back in your house. So mommy and daddy might have to make some adjustments themselves. And they do make them. Thank you, Jackie. All right. Now, now I want to show you what grace is for. Why do we even have this word? What is, what is it for? Grace is the empowerment to do what God said do. Without it, you can't do what he said do. But you have to be the one that says, I'm going to do it. Yes. All right, because it kicks in only when you make up your mind you're going to do it. Amen. So you're sitting there looking at me going, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. I don't, and I sympathize with you. But I'll tell you until you make up your mind that you're going to suck your sad face up and you're going to do something with that ugly look you got, walking around in a pity party from sun up to sundown, screaming about how bad the kids are and how bad the job is until you, mama and daddy, make up your mind to count it all joy and you decide that you're going to get your joy from Jesus, you can forget talking to me about the kids and the circumstances because the circumstance, even if it was perfect, you'd still be mad. I mean, I've been to Russia. I have been to a country where they get on a bus and it takes them three hours to get to church. I've been to a country where they have to stand in line for an hour to get the meal that day. I've been to a country where there's only one ball in the whole city for the kids to play with. I have been to countries that are nothing like this one. And I've been around Christians who walk into a church and they're on fire for God. They love Jesus. They are, they are a happy people. And then you come back home and sit and look at you. You got dishwashers, air conditioners. You drove less than 10 miles to get here and you look terrible. <laughs> it's the truth. Why do y'all think I spent so much time overseas? I needed to get out of here. You know how nice it is to go to a church where people walk in and you preach on being filled with the Holy Ghost and all 500 of them instantly start talking in tongues because they're listening to it and obeying God? And, you're, and I come home and y'all are going, well, let me pray about that for six months. I got to go home and worry about the government getting all them, my taxes and I only made 100000 last year. And only, oh, shut up. Golly, gee willikers, dude. All right. Only. So y'all are doing good. I'm still, okay, you're still here. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, pop it on the screen. Let's start off with this. For you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The grace of God, and we've talked about this so many times before, the grace of God is God's ability 
to do what you can't do. In other words, when you walked in, you said, I cannot make heaven. I can't keep that. And so you walked forward and you received Jesus, simple, and the grace of God, he gave you his faith, he gave you his life and his favor, and he made it easy for you so that you were able to do something that you couldn't do. Now, after we read that, go to James chapter 4. I want to show you something. Getting ahead of myself here a little bit. I, I should just start reading with verse, I mean, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, look, look at this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they come from the desires for pleasure that wars in your members? You lust, you don't have. You murder, you covet, you can't obtain it. You fight in war, you don't have because you don't ask. You ask and you don't receive that you, because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with this world is enmity with God? One translation says it'll make you the enemy of God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously, but he gives more what? Grace. Grace. God can increase the grace on your life. Yes. Now, I'm going to explain grace to you in a way that will make all the sense in the world. You could leave here right now and you can walk to Winn-Dixie and then you can walk home. But most of you didn't. You're like, I, I am not walking anywhere. I don't get a car. Right? So mo I would say that most of us in here have a car or you took a bus. Okay. That, that, what that is, that's a level of power in your life that makes life easier. Is it easier to have a car or is it easier to walk? Which is easier? Car. Now, the, having a car, you remember when you were growing up and you told your parents, I want my own car, and they said, get a job. Because I am not going to buy it for you. And then you get insurance and you buy your own gas and you get a life. Now, they didn't say that to put you in condemnation. They said that to get you free from home, get you out of their hair, and to get you an easier way of life. Did y'all enjoy your first car? And you, you know, when, when Che bought her first truck, and I told her mom, I said, don't buy a nice one. Don't, don't buy a, they're going to wreck it for sure. So sure enough, the first week in school, the kids jumped on the hood, bended it in. After that, she flipped it and ran it in a ditch. Just, just get, them, get them an old clunker until they learn how to drive. I know they know how to drive or they tell you, we know, we know this. We've been doing this so long. Right. There's something about just banging something once and then the light comes on and you realize that that car doesn't stop as fast as you thought it did. And, and then after you burn the tires off and then you go buy a set, you don't want to burn the next set. So anyway, I'm preaching to the choir. But having a car is, is very much like God giving you grace. Now, Back in the 50s, if you wanted to get to Tennessee or North Carolina, there is a road out there called 441. There was no such thing as an interstate. Did y'all know that? And you could get in your car and you could go to North Carolina, but how long do you think it would take you to get there? A, a long time. Beats walking. Right? Better than walking, right? Now, now, how long do you think? Can you get on 441 traffic light after traffic light after traffic light? Two days. 
two days. Two days to get to North Carolina. All right, how long to get to Michigan? Five? Five days? Okay. So, so the, the Corps of Engineers got together and said, why don't we just make it easier on them? Why don't we make a road where there is no red lights, where if they want to go someplace, they can get on it, do 80, and whoop it if they got to go to the bathroom. They have little rest stops on the side or, or someplace. But I mean, now North Carolina is about 8, 10, 12 hours, depending on whether you're on a gold wing or not. It depends on how long it takes. But, but in other words, it's not two days. It, is that harder or easier? It's easier. All right. Now, I went up to see uh, Dr. Varallo in, um, in, in uh, Michigan this week, this week, and I flew home last night. I left Lansing yesterday, and I w- got to Sanford in two hours. Now, does that trump driving on the interstate? Yeah. yeah. All right, now what I have just described to you is what the Bible calls grace. Grace is designed to make your life easier, not harder. Grace is multiplied through obedience. Obedience is not making your life harder. Sin is making your life hard. That's good preaching. Thank you. Amen. I'm I'm being serious here. We, We bought a lie. We bought it hook, line, and sinker. Man, you're telling me I need to pray and read my Bible and go to church. Well, you just don't know what kind of life. And I'm thinking, no, man, and it's going to be bad till the next time I see you. Now, look at this. He gives more what? Grace. But he gives it to the humble. Humble doesn't mean that you're sitting back and you're quiet and pious and don't ever talk to anybody. Humble means you're submitted to God. That's all humble means. You open the Bible and it says count it all joy. Humble people count it all joy. Proud people go, I don't feel like proud at all joy. You don't know what I'm going to do. Walk. Walk to Michigan, honey. Some of us are going, I like flying. Are y'all out there? Isn't this, the the airplane is a wonderful tool. It took Lisa longer to get me from Sanford than it did to get me from Michigan. (laughs) Now do y'all understand? Now I'm going to show you a scripture. So you'll say, well, is this actually in the Bible? I, actually, it is. Go to Luke chapter 3, verse 4. I'm going to show you what Jesus came to do in your life. It is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Go to verse 4. Look at this. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill brought low, crooked places will be made straight, and the rough way smooth. The grace of God is designed to make your life, he wants you to go, oh, God, I love walking with God. Whoa, what took me so long? Do you all see that? I actually got that out of the Bible. Jesus came to make your life easier. Grace is the ability to do what in the natural is impossible to do. Now, here's where we have a problem. Are y'all ready? When the children of Israel came up to the Jordan River, it was flooded. God said, go over. And they went, you're kidding, right? No, I can't do this. Let's think about this for a minute. This is very powerful. God brought them to the Red Sea. Okay, guys, cross. And they're going, we don't swim. 
The Red Sea crossing was the grace of God. Your salvation was the grace of God. God is not asking them to cross the Jordan in their ability. He's asking them to cross it in his ability. So how does God teach you grace? By obedience. All right, I'm going to make a point here, and y'all just hold on to your hats, please. You walk into a church service. You're broke. You're supernaturally broke. You don't have a dime hardly. You, you can't rub two penny hardly. And someone takes up an offer and you go, I ain't putting on my offer. I'm broke. You have a choice now. Are you going to obey? Because see here, if you have a dollar and you give a dime, you have less money. Everybody knows that. (laughs) And you've thought that through. I'm broke. And if I give in the offering, God knows I'll just be broker. No, you won't. Because it is grace. Is the grace of God is going to make you rich. It isn't, you aren't doing this. God didn't ask you to split the Jordan River. He didn't ask you to split the Red Sea. He didn't ask you to save yourself. All he ever asked you to do, do what I said. And now you got to sit there and go, and this is the way I did it. I'm already broke. I might as well give it to the church. Are y'all out there? My act of obedience kicked God's ability into my checkbook. And in one year, I'm out of debt in a new car. That is impossible. That's not reasonable. God is not reasonable. He's always asking you to do things you can't do with time you don't have. Isn't he? And we're always questioning his intelligence. Are you crazy? Couldn't you have got us to the Jordan River and it wasn't flooded? At least if you screwed up, we could walk across it. But you got to get us here when it's flooded. What for? He said, I wanted you to get to a situation where you're not in control. And see, y'all are sitting here right now. Your health insurance has been working, thank God. And your job has been, but you're going to hit a wall that you can't fix. Why don't you start learning the grace of God now instead of waiting until the doctor tells you you got some problem? Why don't you start learning to obey him in the little things that all it's going to cost you is a day or something or a buck or two instead of waiting until all hell breaks loose and then go, somebody pray for me. That's right. And you start running from church to church looking for somebody anointed enough to get you free from disobedience. I didn't say that, did I? (laughs) It's the truth, guys. How many of y'all understand that obedience is actually a great message? All right. Um, Wow. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding gains favor. The way of the unfaithful is what? It's hard. Now, you look at all the people who are out doing their own thing. They're all broke. They're all sick. They're all dying early. The wages of sin was death, is death, always will be death. The happiest people on earth are people who go to church and obey God. They're the happiest people. They're the, they're the richest people. They have the best kids. Well, we're on kids. Let's, let's just take a little side journey. Now, it'll get quiet in this Presbyterian church, but I, hold on a minute. I'm just going to. You know, Lisa and I, when we go up to the mountains, they don't have nursery. They don't even have a children's church. And by God, they don't even have a youth group. And Sunday morning, everybody comes into the service. You know how many babies, you know, cause trouble? None. You know how many kids sit and listen? 
all of them. Because they opened their Bible one day and found the part, train a child in the way he should go. Your, your kids do not have to act like hellions. And we have times we say, well, we're not going to have the kids in children's church today. And parents go, they're going to sit with me. <laughs> they're yours. If you can't handle them, wake up and smell the coffee. I took, one time I went to get my hair cut and I took Josh with me. And I went into the barber and I walked in. I said, Josh, go over and sit down in the chair and just, you know, read a magazine until I get done. So Josh climbed up in the chair, sat and read a book. And the lady said, how'd you get him to do that? I didn't understand what she said. I said, oh, I told him to. She said, and he did it? I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We took our boys out one time to, to dinner with, an, with another person. See, you, do you all know why I don't like to go out with y'all? Because you think that after dinner with me, I got my sermon from the dinner. I, I, I'm not getting my sermons from the dinner with you. So we took, we took Joshua, Justin, and Jordan. We went out to five seasons. Was it five? Bahama Breeze. Same, same area. We're, we're sitting at a round table. What? It's the same, well, it's the same area. It's right there. In the, it's not the same. It's in a, just pray for me. That's what I mean. So anyway, we set the boys down in the restaurant and, you know, and then we have this law in our house. We, we do not lie. If we say we will beat you to death, we will beat you to death. We will beat you. <laughs> and you know, you don't have to do it very much. You look at them and go one time. When we get home, they're going... God, help them forget, help them forget. <laughs> we don't forget. If we say we'll whoop you, we'll whoop you. That's right. So when, when we went out, now we, we, we never, never had any problem with our boys taking them out. Never, never one time did they ever act up. That's amazing, isn't it? When they're home in the pasture, now that's different. <laughs> when they get their four-wheelers, their hot rods, their, they're in the, man, Katie, they're boys. But when we clean them up and put them in the car, we give them the evil eye. You mess up. We'll have a talk when we get home. So we took them out to this restaurant. We took them out with a, with a couple, and they had one boy. God. Mom asked him a question. My boys went. Woo. Not at our house. So, so anyway, this little boy, I mean, he was a terror. We got in the car, and the boys sat in the back. They didn't say nothing. We're on the way home, and they went, that was a bad boy, right, Mommy? Lisa turned around and said, that's right. One of them said, we weren't bad like that, were we, Mommy? No, you were not. Good. <laughs> now, I don't know how I got off on all that, but let's stop for a minute. I learned that in the Bible. That's right. Folks, l- listen, that, that's, that makes life easy. Listen, your, your house, sh- it should be easy. Yeah. It should be. They don't, listen, they, they, will, they will push the envelope a few times. It's okay. If you take them out and they misbehave, it's okay. It's part of their training. Take them out. Don't do it inside. Someone will call the HRS on you. <laughs> Ashley told me one time, she came home from school and she said, if you spank me, I'm going to call the HRS. I said, really? I said, well, I'm going to whip you for saying that. (laughs) And when I get finished, I'm going to give you the phone. (laughs) And you're going to be moving in with with another house full of bratty kids. 
and you can forget Christmas birthday. You can forget it. You ain't got no holly hobby bed over there right now. I'm going to tell you right now, the, the, you think I'm bad? You ain't seen bad, honey. I took her in there and whooped her butt, and I said, here's the phone. I'm not going to make that phone call. I said, well, you just, you just go make it anytime. I said, anytime you don't like it here, there's a door. I'll help you pack. Give me the cell phone. You don't have all this trouble. Take your house back. Now, that's not even in my notes. That just must be God. What, what happened in America to us coming to church and understanding this book was written for our benefit and it is to be obeyed. That is that hard? Is that, that's not, this is not bad. This is good. So we come to church to learn what he said and how to do it. But you, you must, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is not making your life harder. This is making your life easier. And right now, if your life is not easier, you might want to open your Bible and start making some adjustments in your life. All the laying on the hands of the world is not going to change you. Go to Numbers. Chapter 13. When the Lord started talking to me about this the other day, he said, listen, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to make their life easier. Yeah. I'm trying to show them how. But, you know, and, and even I, and, and I understand this, I, I, I'm, I'm not so naive that I don't understand praying more. And, but no, man, I wasn't going to say all this, and I'm going to, I'm just going, I'm just going to tell you a story. When someone comes along and makes a statement, I'm going to teach you to pray more. I'm going to teach you to read your Bible. I'm going to teach you to walk closer to God. Your three biggest enemies are going to be the world, your flesh, and the devil. But you must learn not to think of these things as as taking from you, but adding to you. Now, I'm going to tell you a story right now. When I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Lord said to me, you know, I was trying to pray about where to go. I didn't know where to go. I went off in an apartment every day and, and, um, and prayed. Now, while I was living there, I went through some marriage trouble. I had several women approach me f- for sex. And went, Tulsa girls are bold. They don't even mince words. Just, my husband's not home. It won't be home to midnight. And they start coming out of their clothes. And I'm the maintenance man. I had the thought cross my mind. Turn me down a little bit. Why don't I just do this and then get forgiven? Let me, there's, you, there's 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible, isn't it? Can't you just sin and then go back to God? You can. So why don't we? I'm going to tell you why. Yeah, consequences. There was two particular females. Uh, I won't go into detail. I know y'all, the men want me to, but I'm not going to. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, one of them, one of them was a girl that all she ever wore was a white halter top. And white short shorts, and she was so hot, you had better have the air conditioning on when you walk in her house. This girl could have been in a Playboy magazine. She was drop dead gorgeous and lonely. And she let me know it. Now, understand something Satan doesn't wait until you're, everything's good, he waits till all hell's breaking loose at home. And then you sit back and go, I'm going to tell you what I'll show her. It's just called, now I have a choice. I'm going to obey God or not, right? All right. So the devil says, you know, you can use 1 John 1, 9. I said, well, I can. Remember I said something earlier. I says, the only, there's only one reason to obey God. That's to please him. If you're not, if you don't have the desire to please him, then you're going to fall for every temptation that comes. Because you're going to justify it. 
If you're looking for a reason to dis, you can find one. You, you, you come to this church, it won't be long, I'll take you off and you'll have all the reason you want to to run around being mad. I'm being honest with you. Right after this, this, these two girls approached me. One girl, I had to walk out of her apartment. She was coming out of her clothes. Literally coming out of her clothes. She had already down to panties and bra and coming out of that. And I said, I got to go find the part. And I left and closed the door and I never came back. The next day, she approached me and asked me if I was gay. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not gay. And she sat down on the swing next to me and put her arm around me. And we had a come to Jesus talk. <laughs> all right, now I'm telling you all this because, because of the world we live in today. And, and I had made up my mind to obey God. Right after this, I'm sitting in my office at, at a plainclothes detective came in the office and read me my Miranda rights. A girl had been raped in the apartment complex and blamed me for it. Now, let's pretend for a minute that I had no alibi that day. Where would I be? Would I still be a Christian? Yes? Would I be here? Would I be married to Lisa? No. See, see, God has a plan for you. But, but let me, but would you like to know about grace now? I went off every day and prayed alone. I have no alibi. I'm alone in an apartment from 12 to 1 every day praying in the Holy Ghost. How do you look at a detective and go, I've been off alone in a... Right. The guy that raped her had a mask on, but she knows it was me. That day, I got a phone call from my former boss, Rita McKim. Her husband happens to be the head of the Chamber of Commerce for Tulsa. So she's a very well-known woman, drives a Cadillac, very wealthy. She calls me up and she says, because you're leaving to go to Orlando, you know, or leaving to go in the ministry and you left us, it's, I think it was my birthday or something. She says, we want to take you out to lunch. Well, I didn't want to go because I knew I couldn't afford it. So she says, well, listen, I need you to meet me here at 11 o'clock. And I said, okay. And I went in there and I said, all right, but listen, listen, guys, you've got to make this fast. I don't have all day. And it really bothered me. So I arrived at Raven's Roost at 11. She wasn't there, but the maid was there. And I talked to her till 12. Really, really ticked me off. And then she takes me to a fancy restaurant. I didn't need to go to a fancy restaurant. We were there for an hour and a half. Then I came back and I got to work at three. I'm going from 1030 to three and I'm with someone from 11 to three o'clock. Somebody say, Grace, is God covering my backside? Is God, somebody look at me and say, God is out taking care of you, son. Now listen to me. My obedience is what caused the grace to kick in. Amen. That's right. Yes. Amen. My obedience to God is the thing that has kept me. Yes. Yes. It is not making my life harder. It's making my life easier. So the, he's reading my Miranda rights to me and he said, where were you on such and such a date? And I am, I'm, and at first I said, you're joking. It's not April. You know, I, I don't believe this guy is actually reading Miranda. You have the right to remain silent. And I went, what? <laughs> what? I, I mean, I'm a good guy. I'm a Raymond grad. I love Jesus. I'm not. I didn't, I didn't rave nobody. He said, can you tell me where you were? I went, in an apartment praying. And I looked at my calendar, and that was when I was with Rita. And the, I went, oh, my God, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was having lunch with Rita McKim. Uh, it's a phone number. Uh, city commissioner, whoever, wife. And Mark and the mate and all the people I used to work. That's where I was. He called on the phone, and he walked out and said, have a good day, Mr. Morgan, and left. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Somebody look at me and tell me that this is, that my life is hard. 
That's hard. That's right. That's right. All right. <laughs> I, never, I never got to numbers. Let me read this real quick. I want to show you something in the Bible. Y- y'all ready? Can we finish this? Everybody say, walking with God, walking with God. Makes, life easy. makes life easy. Yes. All right. In Numbers, God said, I want you to go over this, over this river and go into the promised land and see what it's like. They went in there and they said, there's giants in the land. They're bigger than us and we can't take it. The problem is, is all that's true without the grace of God. It is true. They came back and gave an evil report, and Joshua and Caleb said, we're able. If God is for us, we can do this. Now, you and I, sitting here on a Sunday morning in church with your Bibles opened up, we're going to, we're going to run into the exact same thing in your life and in mine. We run into this every day. I'll open up, and it'll go, and I'll go, oh, no, I can't do that. I can't, but just do it. And here's the, why did they not want to do it? They said, we'll die. We'll, we'll cross this river, we'll die. The giants will kill us. Would they have died? And you're not going to either. Are y'all listening? I'm trying my best. I'm, I'm literally pouring my heart out to you. When I want to spend more time in this pulpit teaching you about honor. Honor will lift you. Honor will bring the glory into the church. It's the only thing that'll bring the glory in. The honor, honor and obedience will cause you to live healthy. If you're working umpteen hours and you're working yourself to the bone right now, no condemnation on you. Pick your Bible back up. And you get back in there and you start doing what he told you to do. Quit trying to fix your family. Stop it. Quit trying to fix your kids. Fix you. You fix you. Get the oxygen mask first and put it on your face. You're no good to anybody until you're obeying. And stop blaming circumstances for where you are. It is not true. Do you all see what I just said? Do you all understand this? This is when, when what, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Stop arguing with God. He didn't have a church, and he lost his mind. He, no, he actually is intelligent. When he tells you to count it all joy, there's a reason he told you to count it all joy. There's a reason he told you to shout. There's a reason he told you to pray in the Holy Ghost. There's a reason it's for your benefit. It's not harming you. It's not nobody's crimping your style. Now, every one of us in this room, we deal with this in our life, if we're honest. Right now, your pastor is on, a, is on a crusade to get your pastor closer to God than he's ever been. That's, that's what I'm doing. Now, I, I'm a good guy, but I can get gooder. I have some, I have some areas that need a little polish. Ask Lisa. Well, never mind. It's none of your business. All right. Now, listen. All of us, but all of that is not, I'm not trying to earn anything from God. I'm just positioning myself to fly and not walk. I like riding a car and 441 is nice, but the interstate's better. I like the interstate, but oh my God, flying just trumps it all, baby. And see, life your life this time next year can be so far different than it is right this minute. If you just pick the book back up, Jesus said, be a doer of this word. Do it. 
because a foolish man just reads it. That's right. Now, I'm going to tell one story on me real quick. I have had times in my life where I blamed the people in this church for its lack of growth. I did that. It's wrong because it wasn't y'all. It was me. But when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you will always point the finger and blame. I did it and you do it. We all do it. Then there was a time that I felt like I married the wrong woman. And she's had those thoughts about marrying the wrong guy. If I just married a better guy, I wouldn't be in this mess. It got... All right, here's the skinny. Every one of us go through this. So don't beat yourself up. If you want to live free from condemnation, you get your heart. Now, nobody ever said you had to be perfect. But as long as you're shooting at the bullseye, your heart is perfect. And God honors the heart, not the, not the perfection. Are we good? We good? All right. Now, I'm, I'm officially done, but I'm not sure how to close. Is this, I, I, I just want to assure with you, how many of y'all are ready to go, hey, let's, let's learn a little more about this book. I was reading Kenneth Copeland's book on honor the other day. And I'm, I'm making check marks of things I'm not doing. I'm going, I'm not doing that. And I'm not doing that. <laughs> I need to change that. It's good for me. It's, it's, I, I feel clean. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you something. Once I started working on me, I started singing more. I don't know the words, but I, Lisa goes, that's not how that song goes. <laughs> and I honestly don't know most of the words. I mean, I need a paper, you know. <laughs> Last night, she got her new guitar out, and we were singing, oh, happy day. I, 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 it's just, not, it's fun to sit around the house and just sing all the time. Just, you're so happy, you're going, I am happy. <laughs> and it started. With the Lord, with the Lord dealing with me about grace, you know, just let's kick it up. Are y'all are y'all ready? I want to pray. Father, what a wonderful, what a wonderful day, what a wonderful group of people, people I'm gonna spend eternity with, and people you died for that you love dearly. All of us in this room, Father, I didn't preach a message today. I, I, I everything in my heart was to keep it from sounding like a bunch of condemnation, because it isn't. But, but as Americans, we, we really do need to come back to being a doer of this word. We really do. And, and there's probably people sitting in the room right now that aren't living right. No condemnation. You bore it. Nothing the blood can't fix. But I pray, Father God, you deal with their heart. And they would come to understand that, that they're just making their own life more difficult walking and the, the driving down windy roads. It doesn't have to be that way every day. It can change. And I pray you would deal with their hearts and deal with mine, deal with all of us in here. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for grace. Now we humble ourselves under your mighty hand and you said you'd lift us up and give us more grace. I want you to say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I purpose in my heart to obey you. I know you love me. I know you care about me. There are some areas of my life and they're rough. It's like a bad road. I see now how to fix this. I'm not worried about the road. Just my heart with you. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Forgive me for all the times I've missed it. I didn't obey you. Now give me grace in Jesus' name.